Begin Podfix Network transmission. In three, two, one. Whether you're fly fishing in a stream, getting those ankles wet, or deep in the ocean casting nets, fish nerds, fish nerds, fish nerds, it's a podcast. Hello and welcome to the Fish Nerds, the show about fish, fishing, and eating fish. I'm Clay Groves, Chief Executive Fish Nerd, Licensed Fishing Guide, and your best friend. Welcome back. Working on getting these out for you here as we get through the month of September. All right, so lots been going on here. We got some fish in the news tonight. Doc Martin has interviewed a scientist about plastics. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Uh, and of course, I'm going to tell you about some fishing because we are in New Hampshire here, and we're just wrapping up the lake trout and salmon season. Uh, the fishing regulations in our state uh, make <laughs> make it so that it becomes illegal to fish when the fishing gets good. So right now in New Hampshire, September 30th, which is a couple days from now, it ends the salmon lake trout season, which means you can't fish for them anymore which is unfortunate. But I went out with uh, the last couple of days. I've been out fishing quite a bit. We've been trolling for them. And when we're trolling. We're using uh, lead core line. And we're, I, w- I went out fishing. I had a guy named Charlie McGee from Bucks Bass and Beyond come out and teach me some stuff. And when he goes lake trout fishing, he doesn't worry about like how many colors out and all that stuff. He goes, just send it all out. So we put all the colors out of our lead core. And lead core is, if you don't know, it's a braided line with lead in the middle of it. Theoretically, every color drops down about five feet. Then you put a leader material on the end of it with a swivel and a big shiny spoon on it. The spoon we were using looks like a lake trout, and that's what seems to be what was working. But we sent all the line out, drive the boat around circles at 2.1 mile an hour, and pick up fish. And we've been doing okay. Dave Kellum, an old fish nerd friend, came out with me, and we did fine. We caught a handful of fish. And then I went out fishing just two days ago with um with Vinny, my 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 ice fishing partner and we went trolling we had two hours free and this has never happened in the history of me trolling for fish on silver lake if you fall for a long time you know we're in the hashtag suck at silver lake because it's the worst lake i've ever fished but we managed to hook i uh, didn't land them all 10 lake trout in two hours which has just never happens that means you're busy for two hours trying to catch fish, which is phenomenal and just has never happened. And so I'm, I've got one more fishing trip planned for the, later this week, and then we're done for the season. We're going to put it all away and start planning for ice fishing. And I'm looking forward to that because I love ice fishing more than any other kind of fishing. It's just way fun. I also want to remind you, I remind you, tell you a story because I went fishing in the ocean for the first time in two years. I went down to the Piscataquad River in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, which is right by the big naval shipyard. Dave Kellum, my old fishing buddy, and I went out on his little skiff, and we we were fighting the currents. The currents in that river, some of the hardest and strongest in the world, and we were fighting the current, and we were using sabiki, or he calls them sabaki rigs. I call them sabiki rigs, which is basically a string of little flies with a heavy weight in the bottom, and you jig it through max of uh, schools of mackerel, max of schools, I was going to say, through schools of mackerel, and you catch three or four mackerels at a time. Now, on Dave's boat, he has a uh, live well that he built out of a 55-gallon trash can, <laughs> which is just ridiculous looking, but it works. So we filled it with live mackerel, and then we cruised on over to the spot on the Piscataqua River that had where he thought for sure there would be some big uh, striped bass, and I'm game. Now, the New Hampshire regulations on striped bass, they've got to be like 36 inches before you can keep them, so they're going to be huge fish. And you can, if you're using live bait, you have to use a circle hook. Now, in my life, I have used circle hooks. And in my life, I have never caught a fish using a circle hook. I do not like them. I have no confidence in them. I think they're a terrible invention, unless you're the fish, and they're a perfect invention for a fish. But we follow the rules. We took the mackerels. We put the big circle hook through the face of the mackerel, and then just threw it in the in the in the water and let it swim, and they did their job. They I hooked five, uh, five very big, very big uh, striped bass, and I fought five very big striped bass, and I got exactly let me can do the math here zero into the net because not one got a hook in its face. And Dave hooked seven and landed two. And the two he landed, we were able to get into the net. But as soon as they got the net, they let go of the bait. None of them had a hook puncturing their skin at all because circle hooks 
are junk. I hate them. Uh, if I'm wrong, please go on Facebook or Twitters or the YouTubes and tell me. But man, do I hate circle hooks. Uh, but because I'm not a fish. If I was a fish, I would think, man, these circle hooks are the best because no one can catch me. But I'm not a fish. I don't like them. That's what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand by that. <laughs> so I'll keep updating you every time we talk about how the fishing is going as we're getting prepped for ice fishing season. But it is time for some fish in the news. News, news, fish in the news. Everybody loves their fish in the news. Everybody loves the fish in the news. The first news is big news. From our t- our friends over at the Lure Love Podcast, Tim Beat and uh, John King, the Crappy Hippie, uh, they uh, their their brand new podcast and website won some awards. The Lure Love Podcast took third place for the best website, the 2021 Association of Great Lakes Outdoor Writers Annual Competition, and podcast co-host Tim Tacklebox Beat snagged first place for the best online article for his essay, Deer in a Kayak which you heard here, I think over a year ago on the Fish Nerds podcast, but it was on their blog and they won it. It's a great story. Search our archives on the Fish Nerds. You'll find that um, back uh, when when Tim Beat was our F and SES. But congratulations to uh, Tim Beat and the Crappy Hippie for their award-winning podcast, Lord Love. If you're not already listening to that one, you're missing out. It is a, it's a wonderful podcast, a ton of fun, and we're so happy for Tim and the Crappy Hippie and the work they're doing over at we love podcasts. So there it is. First piece of news. Second piece of news is something that's happened before and it's happened again. Uh, goldfish has had surgery. Yeah. Like this is this is actually from just a couple of days ago, from Friday the 24th of September. And uh, Goldfish has a 300 pound surgery to have a mass removed from his mouth. Now, from his mouth. And I've seen a picture on the website of this cute goldfish and it's cute, but is it 300 pounds cute? I don't know. So most of us, <laughs> goldfish is something we one at a fairground, no big deal. And then when it dies, we let it go. But a 17-year-old bluebell is so loved that her owner just spent 300 pounds for surgery on its mouth. The vet Hannah Jessup said bluebell is, was hand-fed by its owner and will come to the surface for a back rub. So it's a very beloved little little uh, fish there. Uh, but she got ill and had something growing in her mouth that needed taking out. Hannah said bluebell developed a few lumps over the years uh, that we they've been monitoring. And the owners noticed a mask ring in her mouth that meant she couldn't eat. So they had to intervene or this poor little goldfish would die. So they booked the surgery to remove the lump, and and they did it. This is the first time, second time, by the way, by the way this doctor has done the surgery. But, uh, but she did it, and they put the fish to sleep. <laughs> and waking up, and, and so from the time the fish got put to sleep and woke up and recovered, it took one hour, uh, and the procedure only took 20 minutes Bluebell uh, went right back home and is back to normal like it had never happened. Right. Now, if I had 300 pounds extra, I think I would just buy a healthy fish for 20 pounds and then I'd have 280 pounds to buy beer with. What would you do? Would you pay for it? What if you just had tons of extra money? Is it worth it to you to spend that money on a goldfish? Yeah, me either. But that's what they did. There it is. That's your... Other fish in the news. I got some other stuff for you here as well. This time it's about carp. Hundreds of carp in Michigan have died from a herpes outbreak, and this is not the first time it's happened. Uh, you know, everyone knows that carp are promiscuous. They don't use protection when they are mating. They don't tell each other about their conditions. They just kind of go at it all the time. That's that's just the way they are. Everyone knows that about carp. I made that part up about carp. Local authorities have gotten uh, to the bottom of why hundreds of fish were found dead in Michigan's Lake o- uh, Orion in July. The reason? It's called koi herpes, herpes virus, a deadly fish disease uh, that is common, actually, and it kills off carp. The Michigan Department of Natural Resources published the results of its investigation of the fish deaths last week. The fish deaths were first reported back in July when people spotted what they thought to be hundreds of dead fish floating in the lake like 500 of them, which is just north of Detroit. Michigan Department of Natural Resources collected the samples of the carp for testing in July and received help from the Aquatic Animal Health Laboratory Laboratory at Michigan State University to investigate the deaths. The department (laughs) estimates that up to 600 adult carp died from the koi herpes virus infections. Uh, Here's a quote from some of the researchers. As the case with most herpes viruses, koi herpes virus is very specific 
on which fish species it will infect and only affects common carp, koi, and goldfish. That's from Gary Whelan, who's program manager at Michigan Fisheries and Research Division. This is only the third detection of this non-native virus in Michigan waters and known to kill large numbers of its host species at times. Koi herpes virus does not affect any other species of fish and has no impact on birds, mammals, or humans. So that means if, it, if animals eat this carp, it'll be just fine, which is good news. Now, I've heard, I'm not going to read any more, but uh, they can't do it. They're not going to treat it. Uh, and they're not worried about people. But if you do catch a carp, you know, cook it right away and eat it right away if that's your plan. Now, I have heard about other places in the world where they actually infect the carp on purpose with this virus to help stop the invasive spread of the animal. So that has been done. And I think in Australia, it's common to do that. So that's it. That is your fish in the news. You got carp having unprotected carp sex. This poor carp. News, news, fish in the news. Everybody loves their fish in the news. And they do. Everybody loves the fish in the news. We thank Diane's bath salt for our fish in the news theme story. Now, the rest of the show, Doc Martin, you know, can talk. And she loves talking to scientists. Doc Martin's our chief science correspondent. She is a professor over at Emporia State University in Kansas. Doc Martin recently spoke to Tim Holland, who is a biology professor at Loyola University in Chicago, where he teaches and researches water pollution, tries to understand how pollution in freshwater ecosystems are taken up by the freshwater organisms, he then evolved his studies into looking at the effects of trash and litter on animals. And, of course, microplastics are a big part of the discussion. So without any further ado, I'm going to have this interview for you here with Doc Martin and Tim Holland. And if you want to follow Tim on Twitter, his Twitter handle is at Holland, H-O-E-L-L-E-I-N, H-2-O Lab. That's on Twitter. You'll see links on the show notes. Here we go. Hey, everybody. Uh, it's Doc Martin here. I'm really excited to bring in uh, a guest expert on microplastics today. He has a new publication out that I'm excited to share with you. And so um, without further ado, um, I will uh, let him introduce himself. Welcome. Hi, uh, my name is Tim Holine. I'm um, an associate professor in the biology department at Loyola University, Chicago. Uh, great. And so what exactly do you do there? Yeah, people, other people ask me this question too in my life. Uh, I, what I do is teach and do research. And the research that I do focuses on water pollution. So my my real interests um, kind of originally started out as, as wanting to understand how pollutants in water are transformed taken up or, or changed by organisms that, that live in our freshwater ecosystems. And so there's been an evolution in that research for me. Originally, it started out um, thinking about nitrogen and carbon and um, even some chemicals that get into our waterways. And I was interested in the micro microbes that um, absorb those chemicals and change them into other things. But um, along the way with that research, it, it uh, changed because I was working in urban polluted waterways, and uh, I was seeing a lot of trash. So this was maybe about 10 years ago, we were um, working on other projects and started to pick up trash in a way where we could quantify how much and what types of litter were uh, found in our in our beaches and in our um, rivers in the Chicago area. And that kind of developed into a whole collection of studies for me thinking about trash, about plastic, about other kinds of litter, and even the, um, the really small particles like uh, microplastic. And so what does it mean when you quantify trash? That's more than just, you know, picking it up and throwing it in a bag, right? So how does that process look on your end? Uh, well, it can look a couple different ways. You know, we, we work with some volunteer groups where they pick it up and throw it in a bag. And as long as they write down what they find, you know, we, we give them a data sheet where they can categorize what they're picking up. Um, that's data. That helps us understand what kinds of um, different materials are, are out there in the environment. Uh, we do it a little bit more carefully when I'm working uh, with a group of scientists or uh, also with my students. We want to know um, the amount of material in a very specific area. So when we quantify its density, we um, carefully mark out the areas where we're collecting litter. We have a, a process for making sure that we're collecting everything, whether that's 
um, the, the stuff you can see with your eyes or it's the microscopic analysis. Um, it's a more rigid, constrained and detailed process for counting, weighing and categorizing material when we when we were counting trash or microplastic. Yeah. And so, uh, well, I brought you here to talk about uh, your microplastics work. And just for the listeners here, um, this was published in Ecological Applications this year. And the title is A uh, Fish Tale, A Century of Museum Specimens Reveal Increasing Microplastic Concentrations in Freshwater Fish. Um, and you're right, there is quite the methodology there uh, with dealing with microplastics. And so uh, I did want to touch on this really quickly. Um, I noticed all the precautions you took to make sure that your samples weren't contaminated because you can find microplastics everywhere, right? We already know that they're basically ubiquitous. And so can you tell the fans, like, what's that like having to make sure that, you know, microplastics in a jar don't contaminate microplastics from the stream? Yeah, of course. I, I, this was a new discovery for me when we, we started doing this work. Um, you know, you imagine small pieces of plastic as being relatively rare, but it, it turns out um, that because plastic is such a such a ubiquitous part of our lives, that there are small pieces of it all over the place. And I think one of the major sources for our contamination in the laboratory and in the field is from clothing. So we wear a lot of plastic textiles. This is polyester, acrylic, um, uh, other synthetic materials. And when a piece of that fabric breaks, you know, it, it looks like a little thread when you see it under the microscope, but it's it's a piece of plastic. And so that plastic is in the air, it's on our skin, um, it's in the, uh, the kind of carpeting that you might have, other, um, any, any, any source of textile contamination is really challenging to reduce. So, so yeah, we clean everything. We do lots of cleaning. We also wear these special um, frocks. They're kind of these big uh, yellow coats that we, they almost look like a raincoat that we, we wear around the lab um, in, in, the, in an effort to try to keep our clothing from shedding too much and contaminating our glassware or, or our samples. Um, and we run a lot of controls. So we're always testing our water. We're testing our chemicals, our, our clean glassware for um, these microplastic contamination. It's, it's mostly um, synthetic fibers that we find. Um, we just want to try to account for, for all of those materials because they, they really are pervasive. And in our case, we wanted to look back in time. So we're looking at historical specimens where we would expect there to be no plastic because it, it hadn't been invented yet. And we, we absolutely wanted to make sure that we weren't contaminating those, those old samples. Yeah. And so um, the, it was invented, right? The 1950s Bakelite. Uh, mm -hmm. That was the the original plastic, and it's just exploded since then. Um, so I, I do wonder. I I remember. Um, I think it was the early '90s. The plastics make it possible commercials. Do you do you recall those? And I wonder now, like knowing what we know about plastics, and lo and looking back and being like, wow, plastics really do do a lot for us. At what cost? Right. Uh, I don't know if you recall those old commercials. I just I do. I remember <laughs> these kinds of ads about plastic. And I think, you know, we always want to be careful to, to point out that that uh, it is such a part of our economy that that um, is is critical, you know, for shipping, for packaging, for healthcare. You know, there's a lot of advantages. But I think ultimately, like you mentioned, we're, we're coming to terms with the what what the economists would call um, externalities, you know, the. <laughs> the negative consequences that that can occur that we all end up paying for at a big scale. So um, it's, a, it's a difficult balance in that way. And so one of the things we want to know is, well, um, where is the plastic? What kinds are we finding? What kinds are most dangerous? Because I don't know that we can necessarily recreate our economy without plastic, but we can certainly prioritize or, or rank or, or try to make some decisions to reduce the environmental or health impacts. Yeah, so you guys um, made a list of some of the most commonly produced plastics, and you also did, um, was it a spectral analysis of the plastic pieces that you found? And so um, do you want to talk about how you identify what plastics are out there, especially when they're microscopic? 
Yeah, yeah. When you when we find them then that are macroscopic, it it sometimes is easy because we can actually read a logo or see see the um, recycling number on them. Um, and when you have a large piece of plastic, the machinery involved to identify the the polymer type is actually pretty straightforward. But when there's a very small piece of plastic, it becomes much more challenging um, analytically to find out what it is. So we um, we run through a whole series of isolation steps. So we take tissue or water, and we try to get rid of all the organic material, leave behind the plastic material, material. We, we filter it, we, we poke at it, we move these things around, we put them on slides. There's, it's a tedious and, um, and um, challenging process, like so many things in science, and you have to repeat it a whole bunch of times. So, so we're managing these little things, and then we get them onto a slide eventually, and then put them under a special microscope that we use. And um, ours is called an FTIR microscope. Other people use similar um, kinds of approaches or a few other um, um, types of analyses. And basically, you kind of project a, a beam of light at the particle, and then it goes across different wavelengths, and you get a, a readout that looks like a, a bumpy line. And then you essentially try to match up that line from your sample with a, with a library of um, spectral results for known materials. And that works a lot of the times. But sometimes, it doesn't work so great because the material we find in the environment is degraded. So when plastic is is out there, it's it's durable. You know, it persists. It's long lived in the environment, but it it also um, degrades. So it'll get cracked. It'll um, uh, break down according to sunlight. Uh, so UV radiation is one way that it becomes kind of more brittle, and the the polymers can change their shape a little bit. And so the more aged and kind of rugged it is, the sometimes the more challenging it can be to get a good reading. Um, and another component is there's there's a lot of chemicals in plastic. This is something that I learned along the way too. I, I'm not a chemical engineer, but um, in the reading, in the discovery process, we're sort of learning that what we call a polymer is that these terms that we know like polyethylene, polypropylene, PVC, those are like the, the skeleton of the plastic compound um, and that give it its, its properties. But there's additional materials that can be added. So these are called additives. It's a straightforward term. And so the additives are chemicals that are put into the kind of skeleton of this polymer and the additives give the finished product different abilities. Like maybe it makes it more flexible or heat resistant or um, colors are added like dyes. So, so the polymer's in there and there's an, a lot of other chemicals embedded within the polymer. And those can interfere with our readings as well on the microscope. And um, we don't always know what those chemicals are. Um, it, it's a whole suite of organic chemistry that um, is challenging. <laughs> yeah, and so uh, I would imagine, so I've done some emission spectral analysis um, in for physics work, not for biology work, um, but I usually use elements, right? Very, very simple ones like Balmer series hydrogen, very straightforward stuff where there's just a few little lines. Now, the, what you're talking about, you're going to get, I would imagine, kind of a crazy looking graph with a lot of different peaks. Those peaks might have higher or lower magnitude. So you can think of like um, you know, the, the Flint Hills of Kansas, where I am, these nice low bumps versus the Swiss Alps versus, you know, the, the tundra. And so you have all these different peaks and valleys that are happening. And some of that is definitely due to that, that backbone polymer structure, the original thing that makes it the plastic. <laughs> and so I just was wondering, how do you differentiate um, when you look at those? Do you know, oh, this is PVC with an additive? Or, oh no, this is just regular PVC, or what does that look like? Well, it's a, um, I guess it's a, maybe this is a pun, but it's a, it's a spectrum of, <laughs> of certainty, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, they, sometimes they'll match up really well with the library and you can see, okay, I, I feel good about this. And the, the machine we have gives you a reading about the percent match for different potential library hits, you know, that you might get. So we can report something with 70 or 80% certainty that this is a match for this material type. And we try to stick in that range, you know, it, it varies according to what we'll allow. Um, some of the shapes are harder to get a good match than others. Like we, we have the hardest time with these these fibers because they're very very skinny and it's you've got to get this little beam of light mm -hmm. to, to get right onto the width of them so 
So we have a little more leeway with those with our with our match. Um, and someone who's who's really like a, a a chemist, you know, and really knows organic chemistry and and probably chemical engineering of these materials, could pick apart that spectrum and say this peak corresponds to this type of bond, or maybe suggest that there's this additive. My um, that's not my expertise, and so I, I've relied on people to help me learn how to do it. Um, and uh, along with those challenges, just inherent to the to learning a new t- skill like that, th- when you're dealing with environmental samples, there just can be a lot of um, uh, error, a lot of potential factors in the mix that might deviate the peaks this way or that way. And so, so we usually give ourselves like about a 70, 80 percent leeway with the match. Yeah, and I think that's uh, really, really common in, in ecology. Uh, I know we we have some folks that are in the medical field and they want to see that 99.9%. And <laughs> I know that sometimes, you know, I'll do a, a do some kind of like ordination analysis or just something where I'm comparing things and I'm like, wow, 20%? Wow, <laughs> look at all the variants I explained. And, and so I think that that's probably a little bit true here is there's just so many factors about shape, size, extent of degradation, contamination, and all those other factors that have to make it pretty tough. Um, mm-hmm. But you did, you had a lot of success identifying most of what you found still, which is pretty great. Um, and so uh, let's talk about, I guess, we, we found, you found plastics, which I, I, I don't think that's the surprising part, right? We kind of knew that was going to happen. Um, but what you did was you actually looked at how that contamination changed in fish since 1950 by using these museum specimens uh, from several different museums, the Field Museum, Illinois Natural History Survey, and then one other one. Yeah, it's tennis in Tennessee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Um, And so you chose four fish species. Um, We're we're not gonna use the scientific names today, um, although they are very fun to say. So we've got the largemouth bass, the sand shiner, channel cat, and round goby, all I would say pretty familiar species, uh, probably to most folks. Uh, that's almost definitely why you got to choose them. Um, I was, uh, I did notice that you had some criteria that you listed uh, in the paper. You know, they had to have at least five individual specimens available uh, for most decades, and all specimens of the same species were collected in pretty much the same place. And so, um, How'd that go? <laughs> <laughs> I kind of know the answer. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. You know, there's no 100 year old person that's been out there sampling, you know, the same fish species in the same place over that whole period mm-hmm. of time. So, um, yeah, it's the first time I'd worked with the museum collection before. So I was really excited to have the opportunity and I didn't know what to expect. So I asked the fish curator, you know, if this, if something like this was possible, if we could do the study, which would destroy the um the gastrointestinal t- tract of the specimens. And he said, yeah, he's really was enthusiastic and up for it. So our first step was to think about what what would, what, how could we get the best record? We wanted to look at microplastic in fish over the longest time scale possible. And we wanted that to have the least number of potential um, um, wrinkles in the storyline. And so we were looking for a common species, one that um, was collected uh, regularly over the full historical record of the museum, and um, hopefully in the in the same place, so that we could um, kind of control for that. So it quickly whittled down to just a couple of options. You know, there there just isn't. Um, it's a just it's it's by nature it's a discontinuous process. These these oppor- these samples, especially the ones collected in 1900, are opportunistic. Someone was out at the Fox River and they for some reason put a bunch of um, bass in a jar and stuck it on the shelf. You know, that's that's kind of what the, that's the level of organization we're, we're trying to pull together. So, so that's how we ended up with those species. And um, it was also surprising to me that, um, you know, we, we had some, well, I shouldn't say surprising. It was interesting when we went into the collection, I pictured these being um, separate jars but there's a lot of mixing that goes on with these specimens that um, there'll be a whole bunch of individuals together, you know, that are collected at, at one time. Or uh, so you might see a jar that has like 50 fish in it and another one that has one or two fish. And so when you get into the the shelves and really see what's there and what's possible, um, you know, we wanted to also have a 
a light footprint on the museum specimens as well. So, so we were, we felt best about taking a couple of fish out of a jar that had a whole bunch of other fish in it. Um, so it really did take a while to establish just how we were going to do this um, with the practical limitations of the time scale and of the museum collection. Yeah. And I could, can only imagine, right? Because uh, we we read The Feather Thief recently as part of our Fish Nerds book club. And so that whole museum specimens and people might think, oh, they're just sitting there being wasted. And now this is a great opportunity to say, hey, actually, we needed those from 100 years ago. Here are valid reasons to use these dirty old specimens that no one cares about, really advancing science in a really cool way. Um, but my question was going to be that... Uh, the importance of having the fish from the same location. And so um, can you talk a little bit about how microplastic uh, density can change with location and why that was an important consideration for you? Yeah, microplastic is ubiquitous. It, so it is just about everywhere we look, but it also is really highly variable. You know, there's, there's a lot of different ways that this material gets into our waterways and into our organisms. And, um, it's diverse in polymer type. There's different types of plastic. It's diverse in shape and it's diverse in its sources. So we think of the primary sources for microplastic to an urbanized waterway like this as being from um, wastewater, also from um, from road runoff, you know, from urban stormwater. We also, in our area, have combined sewers, which means our street sewers are connected to our uh, building sewers. So when it rains, we get raw sewage in the water and there's uh, plastic in there as well. And then we have plastic coming in through the atmosphere. So there's plastic particles, especially fibers in the dust. And this is indoors, it's outdoors, it's in the rain, it's during the dry periods. And so that adds um, quite a lot of variability to what we find out there. So, so going from one place to another place, you see a lot of variation. And so our, our hope was to try to say, well, if we can at least try to cut down on that as one potential source of variation and, and try as best we can to consider one location over time, that'll help us understand the temporal changes, um, hopefully in a discrete way from the spatial. Very cool. So you, you meticulously went through these museum samples, four fish species worked, you, you took out their guts and did all sorts of cleaning techniques to make sure you could figure out what was in their systems. What did you find? Uh, well, we found what we expected. Actually, we this doesn't always happen. It happens rarely to me, in fact, where you have a hypothesis that comes true in the data. Usually there's something wrong. But in this case, I think because we had a pretty straightforward question and we had such a long record of organisms from 1900 to 2018, we saw the pattern that we expected to see, which was that we didn't see any microplastic particles in the old fish. And then around the middle of the century, we, we started to see some. And then it increased uh, from that point. So there's a lot of variation. You know, one, one um, individual compared to another individual, we saw differences and certainly differences over time. But when we condensed all of the, the data together um, using some statistical modeling approaches, we could come up with a, with a clear um, description of what you can see when you look at the graphs, which is that the microplastic is is increasing from about mid-century up to our, our most recent samples, which was 2018. Yeah, and so um, if any of our listeners download the paper, please go do that and read it. It's a great paper. Figure four is kind of the take-home message there, right, where you're, you're showing that accumulation of data from 1950 to 2018 was your most recent sample, and it really lines up well with that production of plastic, human population uh, within the area that you sample, not, not global human population. And it, it seems like a pretty clear um, it cause and effect. Do you feel like you could say that it's a causal relationship? Well, yeah, in this case we can because because plastic was invented around and, and industrialized around that same time period. And certainly its use has um, uh, increased in an accelerating fashion since then. So. So there are really good models out there for how much plastic is being produced every year. And those data are available and we can see the same kind of pattern in our data with the fish. Um, other people looked for similar patterns in sediment records. And so we had a, a also a study on that figure, which was uh, microplastic in sediment layers that could be dated. And 
the, the same kind of pattern emerged from that record. So, so in this case, I, I would rarely say, yes, we can see cause and effect, but in this particular case, yeah, yeah, we, we, we can demonstrate that with the data. Yeah. Um, and so the other thing you mentioned uh, in this paper, and you sent me two other papers, thank you, by the way, I, I did read those. Uh, and I wanted to talk on this idea that fish traits can affect what you might find. Um, and so you have four, I would say, moderately different fish, right? They're, they're doing different things. And so how can the traits of those fish um, affect what you might expect to find in relation to microplastic ingestion? This is a question that a lot of people who are doing this work are asking because, you know, we have a good sense of how some pollutants move through food webs, like mercury, for example. We know that it kind of will stay in an organism and um, the more of a predator something is, the higher concentrations it will have. And so people have this question with plastic. And the answer isn't necessarily so clear because unlike mercury or other um, chemical toxins, the animals are are clearing, they're excreting this plastic as well. So they aren't necessarily holding on to it forever in their body. Um, so we don't really know, but it's an open question of, do we see that same kind of pattern with plastic? And, and so in one of our analyses, which was in Milwaukee, we looked at a bunch of different fish species um, and had the same question. Well, do, do more predatory organisms have more plastic? And what does that tell us about how it's moving through the food, through the food web? And, and we found, um, yes, in fact, the, the animals that were higher up on the food chain had more plastic in their guts. Um, and the reason we attributed to that was um, uh, exposure, you know, that they're, they're eating other fish and, and invertebrates that have plastic in them as well. And so they're um, kind of continuously exposed to this higher plastic. Um, the student who did this work, the museum project, she did a follow-up study with round gobies, and her name's Lauren Hu, and she um, fed microplastic threads to round gobies, uh, specifically to measure how fast they go through their guts. So she made lots of different fish food with filled with uh, plastic threads. We could do this for gobies because people um, don't really care about <laughs> gobies. They're invasive and it was fine to get the permits. And so you sacrifice them, we look in their guts. And we were finding um, that the plastic was going through, the plastic threads were going through the gobies digestive system uh, at a, in about 24 hours. So they were eating it and excreting it. And I think this is relevant to the other study because it suggests that when we collect a fish, one of these freshwater species, we go out there and collect them and measure what's in their stomach. What we're seeing is probably a relatively recent meal, that it's something that they've ingested uh, just in the last few days. And to me, that also suggests if we repeatedly collect the same species <clears throat> and we're always finding, I don't know, five, eight, 15 particles in, it gut, in its guts, that means it's it's eating that many particles every day and particles meaning microplastics. So, mm -hmm. so we, we wanna have a sense of how much is there, at what rate is it going in and at what rate is it coming out? And all of those questions are coming into focus but are still kind of outstanding in the literature. Yeah, that's super cool. And I do want to know because I know that the listeners want to know how do you feed and then retain the feces of the fish? <laughs> well, uh, feeding them is easy. You know, these fish, we just made um, little, well, I didn't, my student, Lauren, she did She did all this work, but she, <laughs> and this is not easy in the sense that she made these fish food pellets out of um, crackers and blood worms. And then she manually inserted these acrylic threads into the food while it was still wet. And then it kind of dries into this hard ball. So, that took a lot of time, but the, the fish, you know, we starve them for a few days and we feed them. And then we know that they've consumed this many number of particles. Mm -hmm. And then for us, we didn't, we didn't do this with the feces collection. We euthanized the fish and look and look. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Um, are, are gobies messy eaters generally? Uh, more than I thought. I mean, I'm not an ichthyologist, so th this fish work is exciting and new for me, but we thought, oh, well, let's feed them to them, see what happens. So that was just an idea we had and and uh, Lauren was up for it. So we set up all these tanks. It sounded like a um, pet store in the laboratory with all these <laughs> fish and uh, we're feeding them. And the gobies were, we, we would see them sort of like, they'd see the ball of the food pellet come down and they watch it because they're kind of shy. They're, they're hiding in their shelter and then they would pop out and grab it. And they, mm -hmm. yeah, they do kind of, 
um, snap their mouth shut pretty quickly. And we, we actually did a, a part of her study was to measure, um, so we would then take the fish out and see how many of these particles kind of escaped from the food ball Mm-hmm. in the process of consumption. And we have a percentage there that we use to correct for the process. Did that answer your question? Yeah, it did. Because I was wondering that I know a lot of fish, it, it depends on the fish, of course. Um, but some of them are a lot more efficient at eating mm-hmm. than others. And so that was that was kind of my follow-up question of, you, you know you put X number of plastics in the food, um, but man, some fish are just, they want to shake it around and they smack their mouth. It sounds like that's what the goby does. And Maybe fifty percent goes in and fifty percent just goes amok. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and what do you what do you do with something like that? And like yeah, that well, we, we try to measure it basically. And I, I'm trying to remember. I think we were around ten percent. Maybe it was fifteen, but it was okay. fairly low. Like I think they're ambush style predators. Maybe I'm wrong, but they they seem like they're ready to just kind of jump and mm-hmm. grab something. And so it, it's a really fast and seem like a pretty fluid process. Yeah, they got they got. Big mouths. <laughs> yes, they do. They're they're ugly, cute kind of. You know, they're um, <laughs> they are they're invasive, and I know that that's not great, but they're interesting looking, and they they actually can be very um, uh, colorful and dramatic looking too. Well, most fishes deserve more appreciation than they get. <laughs> I'm very biased, so. <laughs> um, well, uh, that's all the questions that I had on the paper. Is there anything else that you want to mention or talk about while I got you here? Uh, well, you know, I think if it's if it's helpful, something I try to point out if I'm talking about this work is I, I feel like the issue of plastic pollution, because it's new and because it's something that is, I don't know, captures people's attention. Uh, I feel like it's a it's been a real stream of bad news. You know, it's a lot of things like this that we did. <laughs> I'm, I'm guilty of participating in, in this, which is like, um, here's a problem you didn't think about and it's bad and now you know it. And so... I want to contribute to um, the body of knowledge about this work, but to me, it's it's most important to also make sure that we're keeping in mind that this knowledge helps us ultimately best when it's directed towards some solution. You know, if if this if this kind of study captures people's interest and it it brings about a discussion about our culture's relationship to plastic and to um, kind of single use materials and and easily disposable and not readily recyclable materials, then I think we're we're doing well to help that conversation move along. And, and to say, well, here's the kinds of materials we find out there in the organisms. These are maybe some of the ones we want to think about substitutions for if we want to rank these or contribute to um, some policy change or, or some, some other bit of public education. So, so while it sounds bad and it's not great, that's for sure. I think I think it's um it's all a part of the the process of um, making making a contribution towards improvements. You know what I mean? We're we're mm-hmm. we're in a discovery phase with a lot of this work, but that that's really an integral part towards I think turning the corner and and thinking about solutions. Right, because doing this, uh, you've already kind of found out here are the main types of plastic pollution, right? There's a lot more than just these, I think you listed half a dozen in this paper. There's there's a lot more than that, mm-hmm. but maybe we don't focus on those as much because that's just not the bulk of what we're encountering, what the organisms are encountering and ingesting. And then, of course, figuring out you know, what are they made of? What is their degradation time, how does it affect the organism's behavior, health, whatever reproductive capacity it is. Um, And then we can look at the main sources. I think one of them, uh, water bottles, I know made it on there with um, the, uh, is it PET? Is the Mm -hmm. water bottles? Yep. Um, And so, you know, that's, that's very tangible, I think. And so by breaking things down like this, you can get a more tangible view of what, what might at first seem like an overwhelming problem. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And and we can also point out that as long as we've been making this material, it's been escaping, you know, and, and it's been out in the environment. So, um, so this has been a pattern that we've had ongoing for a long time, but it, it's not to say that we, we couldn't change this um, mm-hmm. now that we understand it better. Do you have any uh, any idea on how to change it? <laughs> well, I it's a long process, so I would say uh, patience. I think is warranted, but 
Um, generally, when people ask me what they can do, I, I try to point out that there's individual and collective action. So if you think about individual actions being those ones you hear about, which are substitutions, which are um, uh, bringing along your own reusable materials to try to reduce uh, single use um, uh, disposal. Um, recycling is, is you know, helpful if it can be done. Uh, refusing materials, if, if people give you the option and you're able to say no. Um, those kinds of individual actions make a difference and not, not everyone's uh, able to do them all the time. None of us are perfect. We, we're all a part of this economy that, that <laughs> we participate in the, in the consumption and disposal of this um, litter. But, you know, whenever we can do it and in whatever capacity we can, that it matters and it helps. And so individual actions are, are really um, important. And then collective actions, I think, are really important too. So this is something like voting. This is um, uh, if you're so moved, talking to the politicians at all levels, you know, from local governments to um, to the federal government. There's, in, in in my experience, there's a real like grassroots thing that's happened with this topic. You know, even if you think about straws or plastic bags. Um, these weren't a big part of the discussion five or 10 years ago. Um, it really occurred quickly that people were thinking about straws and substitutions for straws. And I, I think that was genuinely a collective grassroots reaction. And so while we're at a stage where we're dealing with a lot of individual types of, of single use plastics, I think that momentum builds and I think it uh, ultimately can uh, lead to progressive action and policy changes um, and public education. So I know it doesn't always feel like a lot to bring a reusable bag to the store, but but it, it is. And that, that's a, a part of the cultural shift that um, is ongoing and it's sometimes happening quickly. So, um, so it, it does give me a sense of optimism that they can make a difference. All right. Um, well, Tim, I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, if uh, our listeners wanted to go find you, on social media or find your work? Is there anywhere that they could go? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, my last name is Holine. It's H-O-E-L-L-E-I-N. And my first name's Tim. So if um, you Google me, I bet that'll show up with uh, my website and Twitter. That's mostly what I use to talk about our research with my students. Um, and I'm yeah, I'm always happy to answer questions, talk to people about it, because I feel like towards that end of trying to make a difference, to me, this is a really... Um, a valuable part of what I can offer. And so um, I'm so happy to have the chance to to talk to you and, and your listeners about about this study with fish, but also of course the broader the broader topic. Fish are just the little the cherry on top, right? <laughs> they are. They're they're the the best part of this work actually. Oh thank you for humoring us. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. You know, mud, water, uh plastic trash, like not so great, but the fish, they're really great. Thanks, Doc, and thanks, Tim. We appreciate you making the fish nerd sound smart. Couldn't do it without you. And that is the whole show. Thank you so much for listening, uh, everybody. So until next time, follow the code of the fish nerds. Spawn early and often. Never trust a freelancer's strings attached and swim against the current every chance you get. I forgot to do thank yous. Big thanks to Doc Martin and to Tim Holland. Thank you to Wally Pleasant for our theme music and Diane's Bath Salts for making our fish in the news theme and that's it we out now we out whether you're fly fishing in a stream getting those ankles wet or deep in the ocean casting nets fish nerds fish nerds fish nerds it's a podcast just for the halibut fry it in a basket or broiled in a pan eat it raw like you're in siam fish nerds Fish nerds, fish nerds, it's a podcast.